OK, state All your right. name. Test. OK, we're good. OK, so I guess I've got a couple minutes. Um, I gave this talk at HamSci, a little bit more expanded. Um, so if you went to that, then this is just a repeat. Uh, if you haven't, then I'll tell you what we did. So um, I, I got to learn about uh, Nivis the, within the last year. Again, like Phil Cherone said, you don't have to work a day in your life. You do what you love. I found out I could do ham radio at work, and it was amazing. Um, I was asked to go to um, uh, Pacific Endeavor exercise um, last year, which was, uh, it was, it was to simulate the earthquake uh, disaster relief in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. And we went out there to try to make HF radios work, and I was like, oh, well, based on what I know, we should be doing Nivis shots. I didn't really understand how to do a Nivis shot. It turns out it's not that hard, but um, if you're doing a Nivis shot, you need a horizontal an antenna. And I think we got that wrong at first when we first went out there. Didn't quite get that. But um, so um, we were able to make it work with the dipole. So a dipole is a great Nivis antenna. So it was an inverted V. Uh, so we learned that. Um, so what we did is uh, after that, I was like, we need to actually test this and get it right so that we can say in the books, this is how you do it properly. So as many of you know, HF and the Army, Army just decided to forget about it once satellites became available. And so now we're realizing that because of cyber, we need to go back to learning HF again. Because at, at some point, the satellites will go down because they'll get cyber attacked. So um, that's my big push for the Army, and you'll be seeing articles coming out about it. I think there's one in Defense News, and I have one coming out in Signal. Um, so uh, here's an awesome buddy poll that we had, um, modified. Luckily, thanks to, as I was on the plane, I realized we were going to have to operate in the Nivis frequency range for that time of day, which is around 5 megahertz. We're using Mars frequencies, not ham frequencies. And um, uh, the buddy pole doesn't do 5 megahertz naturally. You have to get these extra uh, length wire off of it, so we tap that right off of the, the coil. So we put that in, and basically what we tried to do is could we talk across uh, Tefert Mountain? This is at uh, Fort Irwin, California. You, if you ever want to feel like you're deployed without deploying, that is the place to go. Um, there's literally nothing there. And Barstow is 30 minutes away, and it's not a very cool town. Um, so, so we started off with a, uh, our transmitter here. We had, um, we had a transceiver here and here, so we had two different places. We actually put it right here first. And I got to learn this other cool term. Actually, I learned it because was, I was getting everybody licensed during this time. We put a two-meter transmitter here, and, and we were able to talk. And I was like, what the heck? This isn't line of sight. Well, there's this cool thing, and you can talk to me after, the, after this, but there's a cool thing in the, in the, I think, the tech manual, knife edge diffraction. And uh, I'm guessing that's what we witnessed, because literally we couldn't see him, and we could talk to him with no problem. Now, when we put the two-meter over here, we could not talk at all whatsoever. It was definitely dead. So um, then we, we broke out the buddy pole, and we, and we talked on it. So we started at 100 watts. We had the uh, cool thing was we had the Elecraft, um, great Elecraft radio. I got the Army to pay for it. I, again, I don't have to work a day in my life. I don't even have to buy my own equipment. Um, so uh, we got the Elecraft radios out there. We got the 100 watt. Um, we even put the, the uh, um, antenna tuner in there. We talked no problem. We kept bumping it down. So we were curious as to, as to what, frequent, or what um, power we needed to make it over this mountain. It's not that far, but again, we're going up to the ionosphere and back down. So what we did is we uh, got down to 50 watts and we could do voice pretty reliably. Then we said, okay, let's try data and see where we can go with that. So the, the data mode we used was, uh, well, we, we, FT8's all popular. So I tried with FT8 and I was like, actually, we need, we switched to JS8 call because we wanted to actually type in some messages because we're the army, we need to probably send a grid cordon or some kind of piece of useful information other than your signal report. So, um, so we uh, pushed it down. This, this blew my mind. So we, we pushed it down to 10 watts, perfect copy, then 5 watts, perfect copy. Then I was like, well, let's just, let's just try 1 watt. It's probably not going to work. Perfect copy. Then I was like, how low does the Elecraft radio go? Does anybody know how low it goes? It goes to, yeah, 100 milliwatts. So we went to 500 milliwatts, perfect copy. Then we went to 100 milliwatts, and I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. And it, literally, I saw the little thing come across, running 100 milliwatts. I was like totally blown away. So all of you that are blasting 1,500 kilowatts or, or 1,500 watts on FT8, put, just, just try it, just try it. Go look at PSK Reporter, transmit at 10 watts, and see what you get. I bet you will be pleasantly surprised. It works incredibly well. 
Um, then I, uh, I'm a computer scientist, so I wanted to do the graphics, so I took a KML file just to show the magnitude of what's going on. So literally, we're here, we're here, and we're shooting our signal way up here. Isn't that, that blew my mind. Literally, 100 milliwatts can go up to about 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers, I think, is where the ionosphere was that day, and then back down. So if that, it does that, everybody just turn your power amps off when you're doing FT8, is, is what I can say to the ham community. It works really well. That's all I have. <laughs>